Danger Dolan. Rareware started development on Project Dream, a seafaring RPG for the Super Nintendo with the intention of it being their magnum opus. They even got so far as to make a demo for the Super Nintendo and Grant Kirkhoop, composer of Banjo-Kazooie, says that if it still exists, it would be locked away somewhere at Rare headquarters. However, the project was too ambitious to work on the Super Nintendo's limited hardware, even with the additional microprocessor in the cartridge, so it was moved to the N64 disk drive and upgraded to have full polygonal graphics. The N64 version had a unique 3D terrain system with environments made from stretched out polygons. But the 64 also lacked the power to properly live up to Rare's ideas, so they changed the game to be a 3D platformer like the Conquer game that was in development. Then the protagonist was changed from a human, they experimented with various woodland animals, eventually settling with a bear and bird. Banjo Kazooie then became a music focused game, with the musical notes and expansive soundtrack being distinguishing features of the final product. The themes in the game also had some neat interactive elements where the music would change to a harp version of the track when Banjo submerged underwater. In the end, there were a total of 164 tracks. Rare put in this advanced technique to render the graphics so the characters were created with as little texturing as possible to give them a clean look. In return, the land textures ended up being 64 by 64, the largest possible size for the N64. But this technique produced problems to the memory, causing it to fragment. However, the devs managed to fix this by creating an additional system that reshuffled the textures, making only the necessary textures appear at any given moment. Using a glitch in the N64's caching system, Rare planned to have a system that allowed for data to be transferred between the games, giving a chance for the sequel to interact with its predecessor and vice versa. But when players picked apart the game's code, they found that this system was never fully implemented. The secret items in Kazooie can be found by using GameShark, although the eggs and ice key don't actually do anything. Banjo-Kazooie has a lot to show off, even putting it in today's standards. Although there are quite a few problems that stem a lack of industry experience in 3D platforming, as well as a few system limitations that are unavoidable due to the 64's lack of power. The first thing noticeable is the art style, which is, you know, vibrant, unique, more refined than Mario 64's. While they might seem like a small addition, the game's googly eyes are something that anyone who plays the game remembers. In regards to the controls, you need to focus most of your brain power into learning how to fly with accuracy and efficiency. The hardest part by far is aiming the charge attack, which is no reticule to aid you. However, since it's difficult to master, it feels really great when you do land a hit. Gone! Oh, no. Levels are large and have a well-implemented non-linearity. There's a nice mixture of consistency and freshness between each stage making it easy enough to have an idea what you should be doing, while also keeping a sense of exploration in the way of getting lost. The bulk of the game is about finding collectibles, but you don't need to get all of them to beat the game. However, if you do, you're rewarded with some special power-ups to help an enormous amount with the final boss. Power-ups are both level-specific and permanent upgrades, but the level-specific power-ups are much more interesting. They add complexity to the already creative puzzles that are a highlight of the game's level design. Although they can be borderline obscure. For instance, at one point in the game, you need to change into a pumpkin so you can flush yourself down a toilet. The game has a surprise for you when you finally reach the credits. The characters realize that while they save Banjo's sister, they forgot about defeating Gruntilda, and so they return to face her on top of the castle. The final fight is incredibly difficult and is everything that a final boss should be. Long, varied, frustrating as all buggery, and a test of the skills you've learned throughout your adventure. In the end, we didn't beat the game when we played it. The final boss was too much for our drunk and tired brains, which was a sour note to end the night on, but we still had a lot of fun playing the game, and it's definitely worth checking out. Grant Kirkhope played a large part in Banjo's success, with his compositions receiving Best Music of 1998 from IGN. When interviewed years later, Kirkhope revealed that Banjo-Kazooie was his favorite game to work on. Grant was excited to work on Project Dream as he was a big RPG fan, 
Although later on, when he saw what the Conker team were doing, he said he felt his heart sink as Conker looked amazing compared to Project Dream. <laughs> Beneath the name of the ship in Rusty Bucket Bay, it says Twycross England, the location of Rareware HQ. In the beta version of Banjo, there was a portrait of Donkey Kong next to Banjo's bed, but it was changed to be a picture of Tui in the final version. Mumbo reveals a sneak peek at Banjo Tui, as well as hints at some secrets if you collect all 100 jiggies and complete the game. The secrets turn out to be referring to Stop and Swap. Mumbo's speech is made up from cut up samples of Grant Kirkherp saying, Come and have a go if you think you're hard enough, which is a famous soccer chant. Banjo Kazooie was re released on Xbox Live Arcade. This version comes with various changes such as texture upgrades and the font matching nuts and bolts. The most drastic change comes from collecting music notes, which no longer needs to be recollected whenever you die or leave the level. Stop and Swap was also included, making the game interact with nuts and bolts, giving the character bonuses if there's a save game from each game on the console. Rare planned to have more worlds as well as an additional game mode. However, these were cut due to time restraints. There's an option hidden in the game files that allows you to exit to Witch's Lair. Selecting this from the game menu would instantly return you to Gruntilda's Lair without forcing you to run back to the start pad. There's a useless cheat code in the game that unlocks all levels in the game. However, you need to be inside the level in order to unlock it, giving a hint that the codes were probably intended to be entered from somewhere cut from the game. That's it for this video, have a go-